she is uh, writing novels, and she's very, very successful as well. They met for the first time in 1986, so uh, pretty much 30, 31 years have passed until they met personally, and since then they have had a very good relationship, and they actually uh, fly between New York and uh, Mountain View a lot to spend some time with each other. He also had a pretty good relationship at the end with his biological mother, but he never actually had any relationship or actually wanted to meet at all his biological father. This is my personal observation for Steve before I go into the history of things. First of all, Steve's methods of doing things were amazing. I actually I run my own company and I try to always learn from the best. So I look at what, who's successful in the world, try to do the same thing, but try to actually be inspired by that kind of stuff. So, Steve, uh, expert don't know much. If you have actually ever heard Steve talking in an informal way without media, he will tell you uh, experts like to give advice because they cannot do it. <laughs> right? They just tell you how things should be done, but they never go do it because they don't know how to do it. So he was always against the word experts. He didn't like experts uh, and people that say that we are advisors. Advisors is because you cannot, you don't know how to go do it. Especially for Wall Street, people always tell you like, if you want to make more money, this is what you should do, but they don't know how to actually do it themselves. So he always made fun of the Wall Street people that way. He said, customers don't know what they want. I actually believe that very much. Uh, people say usually if you want to actually succeed in business, you have to listen to your customers. And I know that a lot of people need to do that. Steve never listened to his customers. Steve says, I'm always going to do something that customers don't know anything about. I'm going to actually shock them with the new stuff. And that worked for him. A lot of people will try this will not work for them because they're not, they don't have the innovation capability to actually create something significant in the world. Uh, he never um, thought of things based on how people would like to, uh, to go from step A to step B. Uh, I remember, for instance, once he said something about uh, Wayne Gretzkel for, for, uh, for hockey. He says, Wayne said that the reason why he's a great hockey player, uh, Steve said that, is because he always anticipated where the ball is going to or the puck is going to be not where the, ball, where the puck is right now. And that's why he became one of the, the greatest, if not the greatest, in that game. And that's what, uh, what Steve did all his life. He always thought the design counts. I'm sure he definitely can <laughs> definitely tell us all today that he was right. Design does count, right? Um, for a lot of time, when I look, for instance, for Apple and for Microsoft, I always uh, told myself, and I've been in the industry for about 25 years, um, if things, Apple knows how to do things right, and Microsoft knows how to make money. <laughs> so, <laughs> based on that, I definitely find myself always trying to put food on the table, so I became a Microsoft person. But lately, for the last five or six years, obviously Steve proved to all of us that you can do things right and also make a lot of money. So, he was actually very successful at the end with it. The most significant thing on this uh, uh, screen here, folks, is the next one. This affected my life very, very heavily. Steve always says, I, I heard him sing at least four or five times, uh, A players hire A plus players. And I actually believe this very, very much. I noticed also that he said later on that B players hire C players. Yes. And C players hire D players. But A players hire A plus players. Let me explain what he meant by that. <laughs> if you're not very good at what you do, you always want to be the top notch on your company. So you always try to hire people that are lower than you to actually feel superior. But if you're comfortable with who you are, you're always going to try to get the best of the best to work with you. And Steve always did that. He was not afraid. He was very comfortable with what he was trying to do. He always hired people that were smarter than him, which is not an easy thing to find. But he did that. I mean, his latest uh, protege was Tim Cook. Tim is an extremely talented person. We'll leave that to the end if you don't mind. Absolutely. Thanks, man. So, um, he left it in good hands and he actually wrote a letter of resignation on August 11th, uh, only 45 days ago, telling the board of directors that they really need to hire him as a CEO because he's ready. He's has protege for a lot of decades now to do, this, to do this. The other thing that I actually learned from Steve also is that real CEOs demo and real CEOs ship. Um, we are in a very different different uh, industry than anybody else. Like, you could be in the construction business, you could be in the movie business, you could be whatever, hardware business. Software business is very different, folks. You cannot get uh, an extremely intelligent person that knows about accounting and business and sales and run a software company. I've looked around for all the companies out there. 
And the ones that actually go ahead and hire people like this is a previous CEO of Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola or GE or whatever, bring them to the quality of deal. If they were running a billion, multi-billion dollar companies, they can run Apple or they can run Microsoft. And I actually don't believe in that. For software companies, can do that. You, because these people usually, when it comes time to, to show off the product, they want to bring up one of their VPs that know what's going on to develop the product because they're scared. I don't want people to think I'm an idiot. Steve never had that problem. Steve knew his product really well inside out. Same thing with, with Bill Gates. I remember both of them, they were impressive to sit down. How do you have the time during the day with all the business and Wall Street and analysts and all that stuff to understand how things are working on the chip level of your product? And they knew that. And that makes them very impressive, make them make right decisions for their company. Changing your mind is a sign of intelligence. A lot of people consider Steve to be an egomaniac and all that stuff, and there's a lot of stories about that, but um, the, the truth of the matter is he never had a problem changing his mind. People can actually change his mind, and it happened several times. The latest one is for the iPhone. iPhone, Steve said, no apps. I don't know if you remember this or not. So that iPhone will not have an app store. We would not allow people to write apps because they can write apps that damage our phone and we have no business with that. Six months later, Tim Cook and other executives convinced him there should be an app store to open it up. And he changed his mind and it was a good decision. And he actually admitted it was a good decision. The education of Steve. Uh, Steve actually attended Cupertino Junior High, which is about maybe, maybe three miles away from here and then went to uh, Homestead High School in Cupertino, California. So it just gave me chills to know that everything I'm going to tell you for the next maybe 10, 15 minutes happened in the five mile radius from where we are today. This is unbelievable. Following high school graduation in 1972, Steve enrolled at Reed College in Portland, Oregon. And that was his stunt for a couple of years outside of California going to Portland. And uh, for a lot of people that are actually shocked, Steve is not a um, college guy. He actually stayed in college for six months. He hated it. They would ask him to take these GE classes and history and English or whatever, and he hated all that stuff. He wanted to get technical. He wanted to do things that he liked. So this college thing was not for him. He hated it. He dropped out after six months. And after he hated it, moved out of the Reed College, he went back to Reed College not as a student, but he wanted to take some classes that he was interested in. Finally, he does not have to take his GE classes. They could bore him to death. One of the classes he took in 1972 was the calligraphy class. And it's amazing for us now, after all these years, to think about 40 years ago or so, the uh, calligraphy class, this is where he learned the multiple five faces and proportional space part. And he fell in love with it. And this is so beautiful. I saw him once talking about his, I mean, how can you actually talk for half an hour on just five faces and space fonts? I can talk about it for 30 seconds and there's nothing else to do. He can talk for hours on this stuff and he loves it. If he has not taken this class, folks, the first Mac in 1984 would not have had this built into it. And as he said in his uh, commencement uh, speech in 2005 um, for Stanford, if he hasn't done it, Windows 2 would not have stolen the idea and put it in Windows. <laughs> the employment of Steve was actually uh, amazing as well. Uh, Steve actually started his first job when he was very young at HP here in Cupertino, in Billet Packard. And this is where he met Steve Wozniak for the first time. Steve was actually the more technical guy. So Steve was the, uh, uh, Steve Wozniak. So Steve Jobs always talked about him as the electronic hacker of the team. He loved to open circuits and uh, do things. And actually Steve Jobs did not like to get down into soldering things and whatever. But Wozniak loved to do that kind of stuff. He was the electronic hacker of the team between both of them. In 1974, folks, he took a job as a technician at Atari. Remember that company, folks? This is where we grew up on that playing the stuff for my kids. Uh, this is the Nintendo, okay? <laughs> All right. Uh, in 1974, after he started, he took a leave of absence for a little bit, and he actually went to India. And there, he actually became a Buddhist. And until today, when he died, actually last week, he was a, uh, definitely uh, from the Buddhist uh, religion. Also, Steve returned to his previous job at Atari after he got back and was given the task of creating a circuit board for the game Breakout. Anybody remember the game Breakout on Atari? All right, so actually the CEO at the time uh, of Atari told his employees here in the valley, told them, if you guys can actually eliminate chips inside of the board, every time you eliminate one chip to make it smaller, I'll give you $100 for each chip. And people were able to take maybe two or three chips after several weeks of hard, hard work. 
Um, Steve Jobs met with Wozniak, and Wozniak did most of the work, actually, even Steve Jobs said that. They were able to take out 50 chips out of the uh, board to make it uh, small. Wozniak went to the point where he took so many chips that it was impossible to reproduce the, the, the board in manufacturing. It was just impossible to make things so close to each other like that. So actually, he didn't do it. But they still asked for the five thousand dollars. How did Apple start? Apple started in 1976. Uh, some of you I can see, uh, probably my age as well. You can remember that this um, we read about this all over the place. It was between Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, and Ronald Wayne. They founded Apple. Uh, after that, they got some more money uh, from a fourth person. And in 1978, Apple recruited Mike Scott from National Semiconductor. So they hired him from there. And that was the first time Steve Jobs started to learn from his mistakes. You cannot get somebody who's brilliant in a different industry and give them a company that does computers and software and so on. That didn't go very well. Actually, the company did not do very well at all under Mike Scott. So in 1983, after four and a half years, uh, Steve made one of the amazing decisions of his life, that he uh, thought it was the best decision, then regretted it very much, and then he thought it was the best decision again. So during his life, the decision went back and forth. He actually hired John Scully, probably all of you heard the name, uh, but away from Pepsi Cola. He thought, if I get this guy very, very famous and very rich, and very, he knows everybody, and he created an empire in Pepsi Cola, I want him to run Apple as a CEO. So they hired Scully. On January 24th, 1984, with Scully on the, uh, on the top and Steve Jobs uh, driving the new Macintosh. They released it in 1984, and it was very emotional. I don't know if you've seen the video of Steve in 1984 uh, releasing here in, uh, in San Francisco the, uh, the first Macintosh. It was very emotional. He worked day and night, 22 hours a day for this to work, and it was successful. But the industry was not ready for that, and I'm sure everybody here remembers the stories uh, that it was a great thing, but it was before its time. An industry-wide sales slump towards the end of 1984 caused a deterioration in the relationship between Scully and Steve Jobs. And he went to the board, Scully, and he got actually the guy that started Apple fired. He actually got Steve Jobs fired from the company. At the time, it was devastating. Steve used to say, like, I can't believe they are actually finding the guy that started the company. How can that possibly work? Well, that's called public companies. Public companies, once you go public, there is no such thing as uh, owner or founder of the company. If they need to get you out, they can get you out. So he was fired. At the time, it was devastating. He was very sad about it. He took some time off to figure out what he wants to do. But later on, 10, 15 years later, he always talked about that, saying it was the best thing that ever happened to him. Because Apple was starting to get big. We're talking about $2 billion now between him and Wozniak going on. So he was limited to his freedom of innovation. So now when he was fired, he had some money. He had, in the millions, he had money. But he was able to think back as an entrepreneur. And he loved that time. He was able to actually come up with things that you cannot usually do when you're the head of a public company all the way the top. So what did he do? He actually took some of that money he made. He went and started another company, which is Next Computers. Next Computers, he actually used $7 million from his own money to actually start this company. A year later, he ran out of money. <laughs> right? So when he ran out of money, Steve convinced Ross Perot. Remember Ross Perot? He wanted to have that money. Um, he invested heavily in Next. He gave Steve Jobs a lot of money to actually build the, the product, which was hardware products. The Next workstation uh, were great, uh, were really good. I mean, they looked kind of ugly. But remember, what, what's in the picture there, folks? This is the first server ever that was able to actually get called from the outside. Actually, before anything else, this is a, a, a server on a, on a PC scale without Unix and all of a sudden that would actually, before any Windows server came up, this is the first server that Next actually had working. They focused on education. They wanted to sell the stuff for education at university and so on. But the price tag was $9999, $10,000. Didn't go very well. People are not going to spend at the time $10,000 to buy a workstation. So at the same year, they worked it out again, and they revised the second generation. It's called Next Cube, if you remember the picture of that. And it was released also in 1990. In 1993, three years later, trying to sell the heck out of this thing, uh, it was not really very successful. They only sold 50,000 machines. So what they decided in 1996 is like, OK, enough of that hardware stuff. 
let's turn next into a software company. And that was the best decision, I think. I think that moment actually is the trigger for everything that came after that. So keep that in mind, folks, when you think about what happened in 1996, when they decided to actually make Next a software company, not a hardware company, and they came up with something called Web Objects. Anybody here heard of Web Objects? All right. So keep that in mind, because Web Objects, people usually don't hear about it, and, but it was it's still today is actually the basis of the App Store, of Mobile Me, on and iTunes for Apple. It's all written in Web Objects. In 1997, Next was acquired by Apple again for over $480 million. Uh, at the time, that's not a lot of money for what we give today in the billions, but this was the re reunification of Steve Jobs coming back to this company for Apple. Let's talk a little bit about Pixar and Disney, which is really an amazing story. In 1986, Steve bought the graphics group. Later, he renamed it to Pixar from Lucasfilm. He met with George Lucas, and he convinced him to sell on that a small little part of the business that was not making a lot of money, he thought he could do something better with it, and he spent $10 million. So I want to take a look at the dates in here. So there is $7 million spent on next, $10 million spent on the graphic groups. That's why he ran out of money, because uh, he spent all his money trying to create all this entrepreneurial ship at the same time. Pixar was originally based in San, for San Rafael, uh, here in California, right across the bridge from San Francisco, but since moved to Emeryville. After years of nonprofit, because they were trying to work on hardware again uh, for Pixar, uh, they got into a contract with Disney that again proved to be a completely game changer for Apple and for Steve personally. They produced the first um, animated film, which is Story Story, that's 100% done uh, with computers. Uh, brought fame and critical acclaim to the studio when it was released in 1995. It was an amazing film. It was nobody could believe how. It was actually made, and uh, it was definitely Pixar started jumping 100 times fold. The following 15 years, folks, I'm sure everybody here knows the rest of the story. They came up after that with Bugs Life, Toy Story 2, Monster Inc., Finding Nemo, Toy Story 3, and a lot of them won Oscars here in the United States, which was amazing. That changed, of course, the whole idea behind Pixar. In 2003 and 2004, which is not too long ago, I mean, we're talking about dates, folks, in our lifetime. This is incredible. Uh, Steve had a major fallout with Michael Eisner. It's documented, it's all over the web. You can uh, tell that they did not see eye to eye at all. They didn't like each other much whatsoever. And Michael Eisner from Disney decided to uh, not renew the contract for Pixar, which was a major mistake. It got him fired, actually, a few years later, especially the board of directors of Disney, with Roy Disney on it, were all on Steve's job side. So he got fired, and as soon as he got fired, Bob Eager, in 2005, um, took the job at Disney. And the first thing, the first thing he did on the first week is to call for Steve Jobs to come to, uh, to Disney and apologize to him and try to make a deal. And the deal did not work very well either, but they were at least on talking conditions and they were next to each other. What happened later is Steve Jobs got what he wanted, which is a $7.5, a $7.4 billion for the price of Pixar. Not bad for a $10 million investment. And it was all in stock, which is even smarter on Steve Jobs, not to get the cash. The $7.4 billion is definitely a lot of money, but he got it in stock. That made Steve Jobs the number one largest single shareholder at Disney till today, folks. Till today, he owns 7% of Disney. And when we talk about 7% of Disney, that is an amazing thing to talk about. Roy Disney owns 1% of the company. Michael Eisner owns currently less than 1% of the company, and that's in billions. And Steve Jobs, uh, till today, owns 7% of the Disney stock. Mm -hmm. The return to Apple. In 1996, Apple announced that it would buy next for $429 million. In 1997, Steve was announced interim chief executive of Apple. So it was back to normal. Steve, in 1997, took the helm again and was able to say, let's go ahead and do this. Next step. By the way, the next step from Next, that's what ended up being the Mac OS X, the software piece. So you can see now how Next actually changed a lot of things in current Apple. Okay? One of the biggest things that happened in the year 2000, folks, which is only 11 years ago, is that at Mac World Expo in 2000 here in Wisconsin, Steve dropped the interim uh, from his title. He became the CEO of the company. And Apple was on its way to become one of the most powerful companies in the world. And this is what all the audience called them until today, I CEO. So, um, 
the return to Apple with the introduction of iPod, portable uh, music player, the iTunes digital music store, and the iTunes store. Apple has achieved tremendous success, and I'm sure everybody in the room here knows where they are today because of all the stuff that we decided to do. On June 29, 2007, Apple entered the cellular phone business with the first iPhone. And that changed a lot of people's lives. I mean, one of the things that was amazing to me is that I was in tears actually in the airport and I was reading everything that's going on um, a few minutes after it was announced on my iPhone. And then I'm sitting in the airport and you know all the seats are next to each other and I'm looking at all the people around me and they're all reading on their iPhones. And then all of us just brought the heads up like this and looking at each other without saying anything. They wanted to look at me and say like, did you hear the news? Until one of them broke the ice and said, did you hear the news? And everybody says, yes. Within three minutes, everybody in the airport on their iPhones, that changed our mind. It couldn't have happened 10 years ago. It could have happened six years ago. It's just amazing that because of this man's innovation that this is how things travel now worldwide. I go to Europe a lot and Australia, and everybody on their iPhone, and the communication is unbelievable. Actually, I believe personally, because I'm also from, uh, from a background of Middle East, uh, that device and that man caused a lot of countries in the Middle East in the last year to actually change course just because of that device. It's just unbelievable. We have to talk a little bit about the health to understand where this man is coming from. In mid-2004, uh, Steve actually was announced, uh, announced to all the employees of Apple that he has a diagnosed, has been diagnosed with a, a cancer tumor in his pancreas. It's unfortunate because with all the money in the world, a lot of, can pain, uh, a lot of cancers can be treated. There's one cancer, I'm sure some of you here especially living here next to Stanford, very knows that the pancreatic cancer is one that unfortunately there's not much you can do about. But he was lucky. After they did some, uh, some tests on him, they found out that the kind of cancer he had in the pancreas can be cured with an operation. He didn't want to do it. His belief, his Buddhist belief, did not let him actually do this operation. So he waited for six months and his family pushed him to do it. So after six months, he decided to do the operation and the operation was successful. And uh, he came out after that the following year in here in Stanford with did the commencement speech. He told them that I'm free of cancer now and I hope to live another two or three decades. Um, and he, he was full of life at the time. He was very happy to do that. That operation was called the Whipple procedure, which is to go in uh, and take that piece of the tumor completely. And it's known for that, that, that kind of disease for the pancreatic cancer that it can be cured, not the bad one, which was great for him at the time. In mid-2009, he received a liver transplant. A lot of people on the news say that uh, Steve died last week because of pancreatic cancer. I actually am not a doctor, but based on so much stuff that I've read and talked to people that knew him, uh, I will tell you that it's a cause, but it was not a direct cause. I mean, I think the pancreatic cancer was gone, but it was causing so much damage when it was there to the liver and after the transplant that he could not uh, get back to normal. So, the cancer was gone, but it already made his, his damage. So it's the liver transplant, and what it did to his immune system that actually probably took it down. Jobs announced um, his resignation from the role of Apple CEO on August 24th. Folks, this is 40 days ago. He sent a letter uh, to the board telling them it's done. I want to share with you some of his accomplishments, which is unbelievable. Steve Jobs has his name on 338 U.S. patents. In 1982, Time Magazine called him.
enough stuff for a per, for like five or six people in a lifetime. Huh? The good news is the end was peaceful. He had died at home last week. He has a wonderful wife for 20 years, three children, and a fourth child from a previous relationship. And I believe all of us are very lucky to have lived in the same time, the same area as him uh, for, for our lives in here. Uh, thank you, Steve. Rest in peace. And if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to stand up for a moment of silence for this. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming. Appreciate it.